thank you very much, uh, Dermot. It really is a real pleasure to be here this today, and uh, I have to touch wood, uh, manage to get here on time, uh, or slightly, you know, behind time, even though we had to change planes in Paris. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I was invited here to Dublin, I immediately said yes, but I couldn't get my time right. And the reason, of course, is very, 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 very straightforward. I have to come see my old friend, Patrick Honohan. Uh, you know, uh, we were a mutual admiration society when we were in the World <laughs> Bank. <clears throat> he had the office just down below, uh, you, know, you know, near mine, and we used to debate a lot uh, in the, uh, uh, the sort of early 90s when, <clears throat> in a sense, a uh, financial crisis was just beginning to appear uh, in the emerging markets. Uh, <clears throat> our then boss, uh, Millet Long, uh, you know, when he started digging into emerging markets, uh, almost all the banking system there were bankrupt. And he hired me uh, and Patrick, I think, if, if I'm not wrong, although you came with Alan Gelb, uh, uh, you know, to think about these issues. And the, the you know, the, from it's, it was then that we began to realize the financial crisis has become global. And, uh, you know, it is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the theme of, you know, today's uh, uh, talk. I think uh, I, I, I do want to thank uh, Brendan and uh, Dai and uh, Shane for in inviting me. Uh, Shane put the title as Fixing Financial Regulation, Lessons from the Asian and Global Financial Crisis. But I asked the word regulation to be changed to crisis because, uh, as you know, Regulation is part of it, but it's not all of it. And just to blame the regulators for the problems clearly is, is, is you know, uh, they have some responsibility, but, but, but not the, in my view, not the, not the main ones. Uh, uh, and and, and the, the, the issue is complicated because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's global, uh, and it's, it, in, in a sense, it's structural. So now let me see how do I use this. Uh, Oops. No. Oh, just point. That's right. Yes. Right. Uh, we all have to start with a caveat. I think you all know about your crisis. Uh, it's not, and the European crisis. I can't claim to be uh, uh, a, uh, an expert on the European one, although I was, uh, in somewhat sense, I wasn't the governor, but I was the deputy uh, in the, during the Asian crisis when I was uh, in the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Um, and um, <clears throat> and to, some ex to a large extent, uh, there are no uh, one-size-fits-all solutions uh, that we need to understand, uh, particularly at the national level. Uh, uh, e each country has their own specific conditions, and you need to think about this. But the global issues are, are, have much more things in common, uh, and so I, I want to fix uh, on the global uh, uh, questions particularly, and see what is in common to all these series of crises, particularly after 1971, uh, and then, you know, draw on some of my experience in analyzing this, and, and then, you know, the, make a very important question, do you fix the financial sector or do you fix the real sector, and which is more important, and then make some suggestions. <clears throat> now, my key message is basically all financial crises are crises of governance. Uh, and we now see it's, uh, uh, and I, 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 don't, I don't need to re repeat this, uh, it's become a major political issue. Uh, you know, not, not a question of blaming, but a political issue how to resolve, uh, even though the roots of it may, may yet, and, and, and the roots of it in certain cases may have been political also. Now, the, the key message is that uh, we, we are at an inflection point between the state and the market. And you know, the ideology was that the market is always right, uh, and mostly the market is right, but at some point of time, the market goes crazy. And at that point of time, the state has to step in. Uh, 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 you know, what is the right balance is, 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 is a crucial issue. And uh, 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 my viewpoint is that we actually are looking at the 21st century problems with 20th century uh, lenses and tools. And uh, until we clarify that, 
we are in both what I call the uh, 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 fallacy of composition and collective action traps, which are systemic issues. This is not a partial problem. This is a systemic problem. And until you understand it's a systemic problem, you can solve it. That's the, 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 the primary uh, uh, message that I want to think. And of course, back to Keynes, he was the one who said that the difficulty lies not in, you know, in new ideas, but escaping from old ones. And, 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 and these ones are very difficult. Now, as you know, in 1971, the gold standard was abandoned. And we need to understand why the gold standard was abandoned. The gold standard was abandoned because the global liquidity was constrained by the supply of gold. You, if, you, if the supply of gold doesn't increase, the world will go into deflation. It's a very simple that. And this is too painful for everybody, since you know, nobody likes deflation. And so they abandoned it, uh, uh, even though you know, the United States retained its gold, gold supply, but abandoned the link. And thereafter said, well, let's uh, uh, go away from fixed exchange rates towards a, uh, a flexible exchange rate regime. And, and thereafterwards, if you really look at it very carefully, uh, Kindleberger was absolutely right. You know, financial crisis has been a hardy perennial. Uh, it's, 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 it's coming faster and faster uh, and larger and larger by scale. And the, 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 the real reason is due to the famous carry trade, that globally we are arbitraging everything uh, and that we're not measuring the, the issues uh, correctly. Uh, so we have now a huge moral hazard. It's not just the Godzillas. I don't mind Godzillas, but they, they grow... Uh, as you know, they, they were discovered by the Japanese, if you've seen the film, uh, through radioactivity, uh, and they just can't stop growing, right? And the question really comes down to how, what is the limit of the financial sector? And it's a question that uh, Adair Turner uh, in, in, in London is, is now uh, asking very seriously. Uh, and it, it is a, it's a serious problem. This is my favorite chart. It's the McKinsey... Uh, uh, Global Institute 209, which shows that the world is highly interconnected uh, and where the, the, the two major hubs are, basically London and New York. And, uh, uh, and it's not surprising that given the very large size of Western European financial assets, that the crisis is highly interlinked between the United States uh, and Europe. Uh, 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 so the, 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 the point that I really want to make that is the financial crisis a systemic crisis, and uh, as the, the point that I was trying to make, we, you know, uh, uh, the book that I wrote in 1993 after I finished the, uh, my stint at the World Bank uh, came to a major conclusion that there are four steps or phases uh, in bank restructuring. This is not crisis restructuring, but bank restructuring. I was concentrating on the banking issues. One of diagnosis, damage control, loss allocation, and changing incentives. And the, if you diagnose the problem wrongly, the prognosis is wrong. That's a very fundamental issue. The damage control, we've gone uh, past that, but we are now actually in the most uh, difficult part, which is the, uh, the uh, loss allocation, because that's a politically the most difficult. Uh, and then we haven't even begun to change the incentives. And that's the, 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 the thing that I really worry about. Now, why are we in this problem? As you know, the Queen of England uh, asked in a very nice way, why didn't we all see this? And our friends at the British Academy, God bless them, uh, said, you know, no, no, none of us saw it, and, and not just none of us in Britain saw it, none of us, all these bright guys around the world didn't see it. Uh, and I thought that was a bit of a cop-out. Uh, we didn't see it because academic disciplines have become too uh, specialized. We are drilling deeper and deeper. We know more and more about less and less. And we assume you know, the very simple economics uh, expression, Ceteris Paribus. But actually, Ceteris Paribus is wrong because it's all reflexive. It's all the feedback mechanism between the different silos. So it, you know, if you really wonder what's the problem in any country, the most difficult part is how to knock heads between the different silos in the government departments who are all responsible for the same problem, and it's somebody else's problem. You know? And then at the global level, every nation says, this is not my problem, it's, it's the foreigner's problem. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so we have a, a massive collective action trap uh, in this regard. 
So Mervyn King was absolutely right. You know, global banks are global in life, uh, but national in death. And when the banks grow seven times larger than GDP, uh, in Iceland's case, 12 times, uh, you know, the nation can go bankrupt trying to, you know, uh, bail it all out. And that's a, sun a fundamental uh, problem. But in a sense, finance is still a servant of the real sector. And it's a reflection. And of course, all our, you know, economic models, those of who are very, very concentrated on the models, finance is an afterthought. You know, you, you, know, you, you, you think about it, uh, and you, you model the real sector, and, you know, you worry about the finance a little bit later. But actually, we have twin crises going on. We have both a financial crisis, which is a crisis of fiat money, and we have a global warming problem. And they have the same root, overconsumption of the global resources financed by overleverage. I mean, borrowing is basically consumption today, you pay tomorrow. That's essentially the name of the game, right? And if you just shuffle bits of pieces of paper, so long as other people are willing to accept it, uh, you can consume uh, uh, based upon you know, uh, other people holding your paper. And of course, it, 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 it can't uh, deal with this. So we're, we are in the most difficult part, and uh, 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 we need to think about it. Now, I thought the easiest way to think about a financial system is what I call the five Ps. You know, the financial system, like every market, is our people's transacting products, which are property rights, right? Based upon a policy, which all, all, all there, and depends upon processes. Now, people tend to forget because standard equilibrium theory assumes that feedback mechanism is negative. You go back to equilibrium. They forgot, like most engineers, most engineers would know that there is positive feedback in the system. And the system can go bigger and bigger until the system blows up, right? Which is the pro-cyclicality. Pro I mean, you know, the, the, the major debate about why I say economics of mainstream thinking is completely outdated is because it was modeled upon Newtonian physics. And we've gone into relativity, we've gone into you know, quantum physics, which are all relative. relative and uh, uh, you know, this mechanistic uh, uh, way of looking at the world, linear way of looking is absolutely wrong. And of course, it depends upon platform. If the platform is wrong, if your payment system, if your clearing systems break down, your system breaks down. We're very lucky during this crisis that enough work was, was done before the crisis to, to fix the platforms. But if the platforms had also gone, I think you know, we would have been in deep, deep trouble. Now, as you know, Kindleberger, writing in the 1970s about you know, mania panics and et cetera, uh, said that there were five uh, causes for a crisis. Firstly, a displacement, uh, then monetary expansion, then overtrading, then revulsion then discredit, basically the Fisher debt deflation. What was the 1970s displacement? It was basically the 89 Chinese uh, and, and Soviet entry of the labor force into the world. That huge labor shock on top of financial liberalization, financial innovation, uh, and globalization created what was called the Great Moderation. And uh, uh, not to, not to uh, um, sort of criticize our central banking friends, because I, I was a central banker, and Patrick still is, uh, there were a lot of people who patted themselves. It was all due to central banking, uh, a good, good monetary policy. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I beg to disagree. Uh, I think it was the real sector issues that people tend to forget. Uh, but that moderation allowed massive uh, monetary expansion. And uh, it began with the loose monetary policy in Japan, and uh, the then loose fiscal policy, and then it started spreading, uh, causing you know, this massive uh, 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 global uh, credit card. And of course, it was due to overtrading. And, and why it overtraded, you know better than, than me. And now we're going exactly through that period of revulsion and the debt deflation. So uh, I think you know, uh, 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 Adair Turner uses these two charts very, 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 very well. And if you go to the, his website and all his talks, you would see that it's all about uh, uh, the shock from an emerging market like, like, like Malaysia, which I grew up uh, in. It was very simple to see. If Malaysia depended upon oil, I mean rubber and tin, and there was globally a demand for oil and tin, the displacement, there was a, 
uh, a sharp increase in uh, a surplus on the current account, your foreign exchange reserves increase, money flows in, bank deposits increase, the banks then begin to lend, right? And if more money goes into the, the, the market, and traditionally uh, people take that money and then say, aha, the country's becoming prosperous, let me put this into the stock market, let me put this into the uh, property market, and the more the credit they pour into it, the more the property rises, self-fulfilling, and then you have this boom that's, that's ongoing. And then, of course, you start overspending because you use the money to import. The, 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 the foreign exchange then drains out, causing liquidity. Uh, uh, and then the, the, you know, the bus starts coming in. Now, that's the old model. The new model is, of course, you, know, you, 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 you have the global players, like the hedge funds or whoever, who says, aha, I can borrow at cheap interest rates, pump it into Thailand, and, boot, and since Thailand's a very small market relative to the global leverage, uh, the market can go up very, very fast. Uh, the more I pump in, the more, the more it grows. I can't lose. Uh, and that's why, you know, during 1997, Hong Kong was called an ATM machine. These funds came in, ding, ding, you know, short sell you, uh, scare the market a little bit, interest rate rise to defend the currency. Uh, uh, and then the stock market collapses, your, your short wins. And uh, uh, if you devalue, your short on the currency wins, you can't lose. Now, where is the game that you can't lose in this, in this world? It just, it's just asymmetric, right? But that's the, 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 the problem. The problem today is that we have a mindset of managing national stability when globalization means that we can't, change, we can't influence monetary policy when the, the capital flows can come in and go out uh, 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 easily. And so, to, to a large extent, Emerging markets face this problem, complain about these capital flows, but even post-Asian crisis, no, everybody ignored it. And you know, the, 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 the Japan's lost decades was really due to these excessive, excessively low, low real interest rates. They thought on standard theory that you know, if you lower interest rates to zero, you will re revive growth. Uh, uh, and uh, for 20 years, they didn't. They pumped lots of money putting concrete all over the place. As you know, they have more concrete in Japan than per capita and everywhere else in the world, uh, and they didn't solve many things because all it did was finance, I'm sorry to say, uh, a little bit of uh, pork barrel politics uh, because of the, of the nature of the uh, uh, construction business, uh, and, and didn't solve their structural issues. Right? Of course, the Japan's problems are much more complicated, but by bringing ze interest rates down to zero, the Japanese basically created a carry trade. Because the more you borrow the yen, right, uh, on a large basis, the yen would devalue. The more you put into the, the whatever currency you want, South Africa rand, the Australian dollar, the Australian dollar would rise, and you know it's, it's it's a double win, right? Your liability depreciates, your asset increases, and so when it reaches what you you think the time comes is too much, you actually reverse. So when you reverse that trade, the foreigner gains because you have better information, you see all this, guess who pays for it? The locals pay for it. Guess who's holding the baby? The locals hold it, right? So, you know, the, 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 the complexity of this global arbitrage is global gain and local pain, right? Which is uh, another version of, uh, of uh, uh, Mervyn King's uh, view. So the, the Asian crisis, in a sense, was the first 21st century network crisis. You know, uh, I think Kam De Su called this, called the Mexican crisis, the first 21st century crisis, but it was a, a single country crisis. But the Asian crisis was actually very special because when it happened in Thailand, and I was the neighbor, right, in Hong Kong, we didn't think that we would be affected. Not with Hong Kong's fundamentals, whereby there was no fiscal debt. Zero, I, I repeat this, Hong Kong had zero fiscal debt, okay? Foreign exchange reserves equivalent to nearly 40% of you know, M1, right? And do you think that Hong Kong dollar could be attacked? It was attacked. So you know, the contagion effects were, you know, were, were, were very, very serious. And you know, when I did my analysis for that book, I suddenly realized, my goodness, this is a network crisis. This is not a crisis of, in fact, the crisis happened in Japan. It was the losses in Japan that had to be distributed in some way and of course, you know, when the banks, Japanese banks could not lend 
in Japan, they went to lend to their neighbors part of the Asian supply chain. And then during the crisis, as they got hurt in 1995, 1996, when they had their first bank runs, the you know, banking crisis within Japan, they were the first to pull out their foreign liabilities, uh, assets. And, and, and in fact, so Asia suffered two ca capital withdrawals. One, the portfolio funds that ran because they thought that Asia was overvalued. And the other was the Japanese bank credit that was being pulled back. And the numbers you know, uh, were larger than most people thought. Now, now you know, when, when, when uh, uh, to nearing the end of that crisis, when they, they attacked the Hong Kong dollar and Hong Kong government intervened, uh, nobody expected that within a few uh, chain reaction that occurred, uh, 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 LTCM, Russia, and Brazil also happened. So the, 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 the thing you know, spread, spread widely. Now, there were mistakes that were made in Asia, and I don't need to re repeat it. You know, Asia made the mistake, and I'm sure you've seen uh, elements of this, borrow short, invest long, borrow foreign currency, invest uh, local currency, double mismatch. And when the thing reverses, you know, instant you know, collapse. But a, in, during 1997-98, carry trade uh, uh, became you know, uh, more and more strong. Uh, but you know, the Asians took the, 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 the tough medicine. I show this chart for you because when I started analyzing the Asian crisis as to say, what's the biggest indicator that would tell me that we get into crisis? In 2003, 2004, these numbers first came out with uh, uh, Giancarlo, is it Giancarlo? Uh, uh, Mylesi Ferretti and Philip Lane. Uh, I think Philip works somewhere around here, yeah. right? Yes, and that's right. And he, they made this uh, global balance sheet, which is the net international investment uh, uh, papers. And I got the tables and I did the calculations. I said, wow, you see exactly who went into crisis during the Asian crisis? Anybody who had net foreign liability greater than 50% of GDP is instantly in crisis, with the single exception of Korea. Look at what's happened in Asia, I mean in Europe. Same issue, right, with the exception of Italy. But you know, that's, uh, uh, that's also you know, uh, contagion and to some extent you know, uh, large uh, domestic uh, debt issues. So you know, when you owe foreigners more than 50% of your GDP, it's a very, very good indicator. Now, it raises a fundamental question. Is finance the engine of growth or an engine of a bubble? That's the heart of the issue that you need to, to, to think about. And we all started, you know, our, our colleagues in the World Bank uh, did a lot of work about how finance was very, very critical, right? And, you know, today the World Bank, uh, or the, rather the IFC would say, every country should have a uh, stock exchange just like you have an you know, international airport, right? And uh, you know you 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 should all imitate Citibank, and your investment banks should all imitate uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, and Hallelujah. You know both both fell into trouble. Now the emerging markets don't know what to do, right? Because their 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 models, uh, uh, you know, have serious problems. So the question really is, what do we really care about? And that's that's where we're at an inflection point. Can finance, is there a social optimality for finance? And my answer is yes. You know, when you overstepped it, you're in deep trouble. Uh, so where is globalized finance out of sync with the real sector? Look at this. Again, McKinsey's numbers, 1980, finance was only 108% of GDP. Today, average 400% of GDP, but in Europe, 555% of GDP, five times, excluding derivatives including derivatives 16 times GDP, right? Notional value. Uh, even uh, gross market values, uh, roughly 40% of GDP. FX turnover, you know, rose from 1.2 trillion daily to 4 trillion daily. You think 4 trillion reserves for Asia is large. You know, that's only one day's transactions, right? Uh, uh, so you know the 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 the, the globe, you know on two hundred over days of transactions, foreign exchange transactions amount to a thousand trillion dollars a year. That's a huge amount, and and with flash trading, 
you know, it's instantaneous. This is the real problem. The financial markets move far faster than the real economy, and the real economy moves fast. I mean, you know, is much even the move, real economy may even adjust fast faster than the, the the mindsets of the people who can't adjust to this speed. So the market today says immediately, immediately that you're bankrupt. Can countries go bankrupt easily like that? And as, as price like that? This is a real question of the tail wagging the dog. I, 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 you know, I seriously think that we've, we've overgone. Now, why do we need to see this as a systemic hole? And it's suddenly I realized that, my God, you really need to look at this systemically from a historical point of view because it's path dependent. You need to look at the, the structural issues. You need to look at the macro issues. You need to look at the micro issues. And it's all interconnected, right? First of all, you know, the, what is the structural issue? The structural issue is today you have gov government systems in which every day you are told to cut taxes because it's good for the market. And every day you're told you've got to reduce, uh, increase uh, welfare expenditure, increase expenditure, a lot of which is welfare expenditure, because that's good for the people. But, you know, we come back to McCorber's statement, you know, income one guinea, expenditure one pound, happiness, income one, one pound, expenditure, you know, one guinea, you know, misery, right? And that's exactly where we're into. Now, the macro problem is that, you know, the global reserve currency issue violates the Triffin dilemma. And I think you need to understand this because whoever issues the national currency has to provide the world with excess liquidity, which by definition is a current account deficit. And years of the Triffin dilemma means that you automatically get into a very large net liability position. You have advantage because you can pay your liability in your domestic currency, but you can't pay it forever, right? So that, you know, that uh, 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 imbalance is structural. And until we solve that structural imbalance, we have a lot of problems. Now, at a micro level, all the incentives are to actually print paper and create credit so that we take money off the table and we leave the losses on a too, too big to fail basis for all, all the rest you know, to pay up. And that's the micro behavior uh, problem, which we haven't solved, solved. And now we come to a loss allocation problem. Now, you, the loss allocation means that when you've overspent, you either ask the next generation to pay for this, or you do it through inflation, or you do it through deflation because everybody loses jobs. Take a pick. There are, no, there are no simple solutions to this, right? That loss allocations, either you can loss allocate to the foreigners, but if in, in, a, in a close world, you, you, somebody has to pay. So if either you, this generation pays, or the next generation pays, or you, know, you, you, you do it to contraction. And the, the, the whole scheme, financial engineering, is a Ponzi scheme, right? It's, you, know, you, you increase the leverage, you, the more you create the credit in the leverage system, right? Let me ask you a very simple question. I, I finally saw this. As you know, I think Patrick can confirm whether this is true. But this is a paper given by uh, 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 Claudia Borio in BIS and uh, Disayat, who basically said that uh, what happened during, the Asian, the, during this current crisis uh, and its tie up with the subprime crisis was that actually Europe borrowed in dollars offshore and reinvested quite a lot in the, uh, the shadow banking system in the United States so that when the subprime crisis occurred, there was a fair amount of losses for the European banking system. And then the European banking system also invested in uh, sovereign debt. Uh, the expansion of the European banking system was very, very large. If the, I, I, I didn't have the time to show you the numbers, but the European banking system expanded far too fast and, and therefore, when the real interest rates on sovereign debt rose, the, the, the insolvency of the sovereign debt problem uh, 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 then infected the banking system, and it's all tied up uh, in, in that regard. But anyway, the shadow banking system, as you know, is the under-regulated uh, investment banks, uh, uh, you know, Fannie Mae's, Ginnie Mae's, uh, money market funds, et cetera, that don't have, you know, that, that, that don't have reserve requirements and therefore actually can create money. Right, and of course, you know the the New York Fed uh, published the numbers that showed that the 
at 207, the shadow banking system was larger than the uh, reg regulated system. But all that credit glut, you know, in, in a sense lowered interest rate far more than the savings glut, as it were. Okay, by arithmetic, uh, the deficits of the United States uh, was, had a surplus in the surplus countries, largely China, Japan, and the OPEC countries. Uh, that's true, but the bigger impetus for global credit growth was the lack of control over the shadow banking system and the banking system itself. Now, if you then look at the way the accounting is done, if the more you print money, the more you create credit, interest rates go lower and lower, risk spreads go lower and lower. And guess what? The, everything is today measured according to a discounted cash flow model. And that discounted cash flow model, as interest rates goes down, the value of the, the, the financial assets increases. Hallelujah. Present value accounting allows me to take this upfront and put all liabilities below the line. I'm an accountant, I know, right? And, uh, and uh, so, below the line means all of you, all of us are going to finally going to pay it, but 50% of bank profits are actually bank salary, right? More or less roughly. Depends upon 30 to, to, to 50. And so, I take the profits up front, you, you all pay for it when, when I collapse. And that's the, 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 the micro model, right? And then, of course, it's bail up because every time the market begins to tank, you know, there's so much pressure on the Greenspan put. So the central bank lowers interest rates, the market gets stable, and, but all you're doing is to postpone the problem, and the financial uh, engineering uh, repeats the same game. So, you know, and all this liquidity is illusory, and we know it, right? It is illusory because the more I reshuffle the paper, the more the liquidity is in the game. Uh, the higher the liquidity, the lower the interest rate, the higher the trading profits. But if the repo market begins to dry up for whatever reason, I begin to sell the un un underlying, right? The liquidity disappears overnight, and illiquidity e is no longer a liquidity crisis, it's a solvency crisis. That's exactly what, we're, what, you know, what we're seeing. And of course, so, central, banker has no long, central banks have no longer become lender of last resort, it become the lender of first resort, and uh, the, the, the zero interest rate policy is just a painkiller. Uh, 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 and, and of course, you can do greater securitization uh, to do this. And so, you know, the, the, and these are, of course, the United States lessons from the bubble and the low interest rate. And this is a serious issue. Now, how serious is this? It's the global imbalance problem. I've described the global imbalance problem. Global imbalance problem is the rich countries, which are the deficit countries, are going through deleveraging, slower growth, devaluation, deflation. And then the uh, emerging markets, are surplus countries, having inflation as a bubble, capital flows, and revaluation. And that sounds perfectly logical. But this is the heart of the problem. If, suppose, all this money that flows from the, the deficit countries, which are reserve currency countries, and they're growing at zero, and the interest rate is zero, I borrow largely and I invest in emerging markets, hoping that emerging markets would have an instantaneous adjustment. The law of one price will ob obviously work. The law of one price says that even emerging markets should have zero interest rates. Boom, they have a ma massive bubble and a massive crash. Exactly what happened in Japan between 1985 and 1990. So we either have imbalanced growth, hoping that some emerging markets can pull everybody else out of the game, or we have balanced recession or balanced deflation. You know, and that's the heart of the strategic issues that we face in the world today. And if you take this table, if you study it very carefully, the G4 countries, basically US, Euro, uh, Yen, and Sterling, account for 55% of world GDP, 12% of world population, runs a current account deficit, and owes the rest of the world, excluding Japan, 6.4 trillion or 20% of their GDP, right? And if you look at those financial assets behind, uh, below the, the line, you would realize that a lot of their so-called financial assets are financial liabilities. And so 
what you see in Europe today is as the real interest rate, just as the real interest rate under, uh, undershot, that means, you know, real interest rate did not reflect the true fundamentals. Today, the interest rate has overshot. I cannot believe that, you know, large countries within Europe uh, should be paying more than 6-7% real interest rates because everybody knows that beyond that level, any country with 100% debt GDP ratio is technically insolvent. And this is the fallacy of, comp fallacy of the analysis. Com companies can go bankrupt. Countries don't because it's a mass massive political game. It comes back down to Keynes's point about the economic consequences of the peace. If you force a country to pay more than it can bear, you have very large political consequences. And in Germany's case, as you know, two world wars were fought for that. So I, I don't have a, a, a technical solution for this is because this is a political issue, but it's something that, you, it, that bears uh, thinking about. So look at what has happened. You know, Thailand is, I think, two or three times larger than Greece, right? Uh, 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 at certainly in, in 97. And it, it was 17 billion, that the, the rescue amount was 17 billion. Korea, which is, uh, what is it, 500 billion economy, uh, had 55 billion. But Greece alone had 150 billion, three t you know, more than uh, eight times uh, what was required for, for Thailand. And if you add all the others, uh, you know, it's significantly larger. And then, of course, if you add or include, you know, the other, the other countries, we're talking about amounts greater than a trillion dollars now. Now, it's not that Europe is not a rich, con rich, rich, rich e economic bloc. The numbers are becoming larger than even single countries can deal with, and maybe even economic blocs can deal with. This is not a, you know, this is a global issue. So, you know, just want to say that until we fix the problem, this problem will escalate in size. And uh, my personal view, uh, for what it's worth, leveraging, if you recall what happened when the Bank, when the bank of England borrowed a billion pounds uh, uh, in, uh, in you know, 1991 or 92, that was the end of the game of the defense of Sterling, right? So in a sense, the heart of the problem is that central bank reserves are not leveraged the market can attack a currency with huge leverages and options and forwards and futures. These are, you know, this is, this is just not um, uh, 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 sustainable. Now, the rescue efforts require, you know, both funding and enforcement. Now, the Asian crisis basically revealed to us that the IMF could not, was not allowed to be the lender of last resort. Okay? Actually, if you really look at it, the Asian crisis was a dollar crisis. All the countries in East Asia were basically trading in dollars, right? The big, big mistake was the Japanese lent in yen, uh, but the income was in dollars, so there was a huge unhedged position. And, you know, this, that's why the yen was highly volatile. Uh, but that's, a, you know, a, a longer story. But since the IMF is not allowed to be a lender of last resort and the Fed didn't want to be, ultimately, you, you adjusted through the pain. And that's why the fund insisted on all the cutting the fiscal, you know, raising interest rates. Everything that was opposite is actually what was done, you know, during this crisis, right? And, uh, uh, but the IMF has a major role. It is the enforcer of last resort. It is the reason why I, in Hong Kong, objected to the uh, Asian Monetary Fund. As you know, the Asian uh, uh, countries were exactly like Europe today. Asia as a whole, East Asia, didn't have a fiscal deficit, didn't have a very large fiscal deficit, didn't have a large current account deficit. There was a lot of savings, right? So the Japanese said, well, you know, if North Asia, or, or, or all of us put, chip our, put our chip, you know, uh, foreign exchange together, we can establish an Asian monetary fund. Guess what? The Europeans objected, the Americans objected, the IMF objected. And, you know, we were in a dilemma, so I thought about it, and I said, can you build a fire engine during a fire? 
I mean, you know, the, the, can a fire engine be effective? You can't because, you know, if it's not effective, you might as well rely on the older fire engine. That's the IMF. You know, the, the, this is the... And then the second question is, even if we accept the AMF, how do we discipline our friends? You know, we Asian you know, economies were exactly like European. We're part of the family, right? You know, you, you know, you're a rich country. I'm a rich country. The crisis proved otherwise, but it doesn't really matter. But, you know, if I lend to you, how do I discipline you? It's a very difficult task. It's better to have an honest cop, completely independent, and the IMF was, a good, was the right institution. They overdid it, as you know, in the early part, and we, talk, we complained about that. But eventually, it reversed uh, its policies, and that's what, that was when, when it was done. So to a large extent, in, in a sense, my conclusion was that the multi, multilateral solution is better than the regional solution. So what are the options for addressing this global financial stability problem? Well, in my view, the European problem is actually a global crisis. It needs a global solution. It's not something you know, that everybody can say that you, know, you can't deal with this. The real question is, to what extent can there be a multilateral funder, right, like the IMF, who has both the carrot and the stick. At the moment, it doesn't have the carrot, it's only a stick. So nobody, you know, nobody's, you know, maybe that's why they weren't brought in in the first place, because we thought we had the carrots, right? Now, but the, 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 any IMF program must have a standstill exit program. Now, this is uh, Armageddon as far as the financial markets are concerned. How can you have a standstill? That was exactly the problem in Thailand, in Asia. In Thailand, when the, 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 the you know, I just, you, it's in my book, but I, I, I'll share this with you in 30 seconds. You know, we in Hong Kong had $100 billion of reserves. We were willing to put a, a billion to assist Thailand. And uh, we pulled together, you know, the, the Australians, the uh, Singaporeans, uh, you know, China, etc. Everybody gave a billion, you know, to help Thailand, right? And, uh, 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 but the, the, the and, and so we got the 1415 uh, a billion uh, together in August 97, but uh, the U.S. Treasury insisted on transparency, and uh, 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 so the, voila, the central bank revealed that they had 34 billion worth of foreign exchange exposure. 17 versus 34, the arithmetic doesn't add up. The amount of money that's available to aid is not enough to the liabilities. Guess what? Everybody ran. Right? That's completely understandable. So the, 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 res, the result is, you, you know, and I, I rang up you know, Stan Fisher, who was my old boss in the, the, the bank, and I said, why can't we do this? Why can't we have a standstill? He said, well, you know, there's no, 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 no mechanism, a legal standing, stand by to do this. And of course, the only, they only introduced the standstill in Christmas 97, when South Korea began to default because everybody realized that if South Korea defaulted, you know, the, the Western banks that lent to South Korea would also have huge holes in their balance sheet, right? And then they imposed a standstill. And that's how, you know, with the standstill, the, the, the markets eventually began, you know, to heal. Uh, so I, I'm a great believer in, in some kind of standstill arrangement to sort out the assets and the liabilities side and then, you know, uh, sort it out. Can you remember? The standard method of solving banking crisis is a bank holiday. And, 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 and the, the reason why banks you know, get into trouble is that of instantaneous uh, uh, flight, car, 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 currency flight. I also argue that a global financial transactions tax is the only way to put some friction into the wheels and to actually to prevent excessive <laughs> leveraging through derivation. You know, uh, the reason why there are no hard budget constraints on financial derivatives because financial derivatives are actually figments of imagination. If you believe they are worth that amount of money, they are worth that amount of money. If you don't believe they're worth the amount, they're worth zero. Okay? And uh, I use a very simple illustration to do this. Pardon me. Uh, 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 what's a derivative? is a piece of paper that represents a real good. Every time I make one derivation, 
I take something. If you believe it's worth four bucks, it's worth four bucks. At the end of the game, I have a 16, 32, 64, and no water in this bottle. <laughs> That's financial engineering for you. Right? Right? I mean, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the hard issue that we need to, 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 to tackle. So we need to get out of this short-termism. You know, private greed is good. Uh, we need to work on long-term collaborative issues. It's not about risk shift. It's about risk share. Risk never disappears. We're all in the same planet. Your risk is my risk. Right? You think contractually you can pass the risk to me, but if I collapse, the risk go back to you. Right? So I think you know, the whole you know, mindset of the financial engineering has, has got real problems. And we need to get back to balance. So actually, finance is useful in its early stages, but beyond a certain stage, and I don't know where, finance becomes so socially you know, non-optimal and could be, a, in, in, in fact, a, you know, a, a burden on the real sector. So ultimately, you really come back to a very fundamental difference between the way Asians think about the problem. In Asia, there's no question finance is a servant of the real sector, not its master. Okay? And, and that explains why, in Asia, there is so much regulation. Now, it may be overdone, but at least it has, you know, they, we, we've learned some very, very major problems of this. Now, how do you solve the problem at the national level? And I'm not here to give you advice on this. I just want to give, share with you my own experience. The Hong Kong experience, which is a fixed exchange rate problem, is that you, the real economy adjusts around that exchange rate. And that's, if I'm not, if I may make a very simple logical extension, that's exactly the, the issue of the euro. When you are pegged to a domestic fixed exchange rate, you can't use the exchange rate. The whole economy needs to adjust to it. And who do you adjust to? In the Hong Kong case, you have to adjust to the US economy, one of the most productive and efficient e economies in the world. And so therefore, within Europe, you may have to adjust to the competitiveness in the benchmark currency, which may be in the case Germany. Now, that's very tough. Because, you know, if they are very, very powerful, uh, uh, I mean, you know, productivity-wise, it's a difficult game. So ultimately, clear the, away the paper, the, of the, the fog of finance, if you clear it away, the bottom line is who is the last man standing. And you better be at the real market level, be better and faster than the last, last guy. Because if you're not, you know, the crisis is you know, the devil takes the, the hindmost, right? Now, so, you know, the, 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 there are very serious real sector, you know, uh, implications for this. And then you need then to start thinking, given your own national comparative advantages, what is your real sector strategy? And ultimately, it really is about, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, jobs. So to, to, to a large extent, if I may say, repeat an old adage, a crisis is a too good an opportunity to miss. Because the Chinese phrase, crisis, is actually the word danger plus opportunity. Right? Normal times, you will never get everybody to agree. In crisis, you have a very short window when you can agree. During that crisis period, if you don't make that commonality of understanding of what the real diagnosis of the problems are, and where you want to go, you can't do this. But the reality of this world today is that we are living not in a world of you can have everything you want in the free market. We actually have constrained optimization. Constrained because we are living, we have natural resource limits. We have legacy uh, institutional frameworks, legacy mindsets. We have a large debt overhang, and we have obsolete mindsets. And those things are the ones that if you really look at the constraint, you know, a simple you know, linear programming issue, you would find that your options are actually fairly limited.
But that's when your creativity really comes in. And so it needs planning for the long term. It goes to show why you know, we in the Fung Global Institute are studying you know, four major research projects. One, where is the global supply chain changing? In the past, it was all from east to west. Once the world rebalances, it will be from west to east, south to south. But after Fukushima and the Bangkok floods, we suddenly realized if you concentrate your production anywhere, you're heading for disaster. Right? And so you know, the, the real sector is changing very fast. The finance sector is also changing very fast in Asia. Let me give a simple illustration. It's not just about the renminbi internationalizing. Everybody's kind of worried about you know, the Chinese are coming. The Indians are also coming. There are, in fact, three 1.3 billion people in the world. In fact, the last 1.3 is bigger than that, but never mind. Everybody knows about the Chinese. Everybody knows about the Indians. They are growing at 8% and above, right? And that trajectory, because of sheer demographics, is increasing. The one with the greatest demographic actually is the Islamic world. The Islamic world is growing you know, demographically faster than everybody else, and it has over just under 60% of the world's oil and gas resources, right? And a very young population. And so if you really take a look at the 7 billion in the world, just under 4 billion is, mo is, is going to grow at significantly faster than the advanced countries, countries can grow, right? Now, so what are the financial issues? It's, you know, by 2020, there will be three reserve currencies, international currencies in Asia, the yen, the renminbi, and the, ru the rupee. Don't underestimate the, the, the scale of the Indian economy. It may look small, very, very fast growing. But look at Japan. Japan is the richest country in the world, a very rapidly aging population with no income for their retirees. The stock market went from 40,000 in 1990 to 8,000 today, right? Uh, and still paying uh, uh, PE ratios slightly higher than you know, other markets and even lower than, than Western markets. The long bond is yielding 1.2%. If the inflation rises at the 200% GDP ratio, the bond market could, could implode. The banking system pays zero interest rates for deposits. And with aging population, the demand for housing is actually declining. So you have very high savings for the retiring population, but where's the income? Where's the cash flow? So you know, these are very serious Asian financial issues that we need to, you know, to deal with. But the third problem is a very straightforward issue, which we're studying now, which is what is the relationship between the state and the market? You know, in the past, you know, after you know, uh, Soviet collapse, you say you know, uh, planning is wrong, the state is wrong, the market is right. Today, obviously, the market has overstretched. And, and so we're studying the 12 five-year plans between China and India to see what, what is the right balance between the state uh, and the market. And actually, the World Bank study in 1993 about the Asian miracle was not wrong. Asian governments succeeded in development because Asian governments mimicked the market. It basically mimicked the market. It didn't create the market because it, you know, in, in, in the early stages of the development, the market didn't exist, but it mimicked it. Now, you know, so the final problem is really one if you know, the West has been saying to the East, we can consume now, you should consume. But I ask myself the question, if every Chinese, every Indian, every Asian consumes like the average American, the average European, there are no natural resources left, period. You, the world simply cannot take it, you know, as, as, as all the environmental studies show this. And so, you know, the, the finance is a short-term crisis, but the, 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 uh, the, the real economy is, is, is a long-term crisis, which you haven't solved. So what can Asia do? And I just want to finish, you know, on this very, very simple point. I think Asia is a major beneficiary of multilateralism and globalization. So Asia has a major stakeholder 
in European and global financial stability. Maybe the way to do is to put some of that savings with the IMF with some kind of facility that would enable the system to be recycled using a global system uh, which would enable the system to have some form of stability. But that does mean that the Bretton Woods uh, uh, shareholdings and representativeness and governance must change. Now we have to recognize that global deleveraging is going to be extremely painful. And we either do this through inflation or through severe deflation, and there are no simple answers. Uh, so, and particularly in a multipolar world, decision making is going to be much, much more complicated. And that really means that we have to have much better dialogue between all of us. And that's, that's, that's uh, I hope, is a hopeful answer, because if we don't have uh, some hope and some cooperation, I think we're going to have heading for some very, very deep waters. Thank you very much indeed.